In today's story, we travel back to a bygone age, when people traveled by horse-drawn carriage, an ostensibly simpler time, when we had far fewer things to worry about. But, as we'll see in tonight's story, those things we did have to worry about were much more mysterious and a lot more deadly. Well, I'm very, very happy to be delivering another story from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so I could read the stories that you sent me. This one has been sitting in the vault for more than a year, so I'm really happy to finally get around to reading this one. Now, you're going to be with me for a full hour this evening. Are you ready? Well, I think you deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. The dank, wretched scent of frail estuary fish and perverse chemicals pervaded the cabin of the ancient stagecoach, with a particular saturation I found difficult to describe prior to my arrival in the parish, though it would one day become my clearest recollection of the place. The strange result of loathsome fish processed in the guts of men with broken backs and weak minds produced an inexorable scent of ailment and rot that led one to question whether it was truly a scent, or rather a curse stricken upon those foolish enough to forsake the comforts of modern society for such an irrelevant and backwards township. Yet the smell drew back some odd, hazy recollection in the recesses of my mind, some ethereal sense of concern to which I could draw no true reminiscence. I thought rather to dwell on this feeling later, as the wailing call of vast and speedy profit to grip my very being those past months. The small, nigh uninhabitable Louisiana County had escaped the attention of the general persons of the state for the unknown decades since its founding. In recent months, however, a strange amalgam of rumours regarding the old parish had pervaded the more prominent parishes of the state. Some claiming that the men of the backwoods parish had begun disappearing in droves in a strange ritual act, involving burying themselves in the ground in massive, shoddily constructed tunnels. Others said that these fellows were engaging in mindless attempts to locate some supposed treasure, having been driven to the brink of madness by the repetition of fishing work. While yet others, namely the authors of pulp fiction works and local journals, spoke to the idea that some monster or sea demon had dragged the men to the very depths of the earth. Yet others sought profit from beneath, seeing the parishioners' excavations as a cheap means of discovering valuables hidden beneath tons of sea-soaked earth. As a result, certain interest groups had acquired a fervent interest in what may lie beneath the murky grey soil of the parish, and paid fairly to any nigh rational figure offering to supply them with frequent updates on the denizens of the old parish, or, more accurately, the fruits of their excavations. At some point, my temptation grew unbearable under the weight of promised coin, and I boarded the coach to the place. The impossibly aged driver was delighted to have found a spare passenger, and was eager to welcome me into his vessel, a wretched old carriage comprised of green, half-rotted wood. His visage was grey and wispy, as if he lacked the constitution to exist beyond the cramped walls of the carriage, in the same way a snail handles poorly life outside the shell. The struggled rasping of his breath resounded throughout the cabin, echoing in upon itself maddeningly against the cracked wooden interior of the carriage during the long ride from the city only loud enough to block out any other auditory stimuli that may serve to occupy one's mind. He sometimes attempted speech, but failed to communicate sufficiently to warrant a reply, beyond a forced chuckle or nod for quite some time. Yet this seemed to please him, as his face never seemed to deviate from the wry grin he'd possessed since I first inquired about his services. Time passed, and as the ride proceeded, my mind drifted further into the rhythmic bumping and swaying of the old wagon, accompanied by corresponding cracks and groans. I began to answer the old man's procession of inquiries. I told of my dreams of wealth, and of redeeming myself of the shame of my past indiscretions. 
The drink had taken much from me, despite serving as treatment for some sickness of the mind that had taken me in my youth. Gin, be it a panacea for all ales, had not yet taken from me the whole of my more positive attributes. In time, he convinced me to run him through the whole of the circumstances that led me to becoming his passenger to the backwoods. I found his company oddly comforting. I stared out the dusty and cracked window idly as I recounted to the ancient driver. The woods that preceded the old parish manifested as a vague perversion of a glade. Excessive dampness pervaded every perceivable surface, from the soil to the grey canopy above the gnarled and suffering willows. The whole of it seemed rather dead, despite the density of the foliage. The sky and ground blended together in a mashed haze of ashen hues, appearing perpetually obscured by a thick fog bank. The ancient driver's ability to navigate the nigh-invisible trail was remarkable in this regard. As to the untrained eye, no path existed, yet the driver managed to follow the invisible road with practiced perfection. I pondered the lifestyle of the town that bookmarked the final livable space following this wretch of land. For what purpose people lived in this wasteland, I could not discern. Even the air itself seemed toxic. Each breath drawn seemed to burn the nostril and cause the flesh of one's chest to ache and tingle queerly. The wood of the willow trees most certainly could not be used to build anything sturdy, and it seemed quite clear that no good crop could grow in such a place, nor could the nature of such an ecosystem support even the hardiest of swamp folk. Soon enough, we had arrived in the old parish. I offered the meager fee to the driver, and exited the cabin, and I finished spilling my story to him. Upon my first step from the carriage, I realized I had not found solid ground as my feet sunk some centimeters into the grey depths of murk that constituted the old parish earth. I found myself in the main thoroughfare of the township, flanked on either side by shoddily yet consistently constructed buildings with illustrated signs hanging from their porch storefronts denoting their function, insinuating the townsfolk were largely illiterate. Each structure's colour palette was consistent enough to convince one that they were, quite literally, cut from the flesh of the same tree. Each building arched strangely off in a tangential direction, having warped from years of exposures to the unkind environment. Camouflaged amongst the moist and drooping buildings were a scant procession of wretched people, all of whom seemed to possess a weird shape, thin yet bloated, each coated in garb of sickening brown rags, sewn together with unusual skill to manifest thick waistcoats, dresses and shirts fashioned in an unusual manner, using some type of leather or fishing line. Their stomachs bulged most unnaturally, and nearly the lot of them seemed to be dripping in loose skin that hung in rolls from their otherwise malnourished-looking bodies. The men and women were hardly distinguishable, aside from the lengths of their hair. There was a strange congruence amongst all the things that comprised the town. Grey, damp, and bent horribly. With an inherent desperation to escape the unpleasantness of the town's main road, I scurried to the entrance of a building that appeared to serve as the town's inn. The porch steps groaned miserably under my weight, and the hinges of the door produced an awful vibrato wail in protest to my entry. The entire interior of the inn had walked to a seemingly impossible curvature. The wooden support beams bent and bowed to a frightening extent clearly representing the direction in which the weight of the structure willed itself downwards into the earth. The dampness of the town's strip pervaded the interior of the inn bar, as it did the outside. The floorboards and tapestries drooped heavily with it. The grey men walked in and out, toting large pots of what was, presumably, a noxious local brew, as indicated by the filthy odour they exuded as they shouldered their way past me in the entry. Dull, thoughtless eyes scanned me. 
Endowed with a sense of anxiety fueled nausea, I dragged myself to the bar and locked eyes with a decrepit old barkeep. The keep was a frail and largely androgynous thing. Their spine was angled precisely the same as the warp supports of the inn, as though the two were intertwined in their gross malformation. Its hair was wispy, white and patchy, tied into an almost ponytail, and was cloaked in some type of dress of an aged red tone, implying to me that I would be speaking to a woman. Her bottom jaw creaked open in preparation to speak, as her dull, sunken eyes examined me with an off combination of scorn and reverence. Business, hey ya? A scratchy and monotone voice inquired. Yeah, I'd heard word about the digging. So have I, she snarked. The patronage of the inn continued their gnarled mumbling around us. Metal tankards swayed and clinked lifelessly. You know, what we'd taken out of the tunnels recently? No, I was hoping to find out just that. Dirt! <laughs> she giggled raspily and punctuated her fit with a deep cough. Tankards were filled and crumpled bills tossed without failure or delay. The maid retained her dull gaze on me as she went about business. Clearly, she had lost the need to apply the effort of sight to her work long before my arrival. I'd like a room, I replied plainly. Keys flew from somewhere beneath the bar, guided by an unseen hand. I lost her gaze to the cracked wood and tankards. Listen, I began, feigning benevolence. The people here could benefit greatly from any information I get back to the rest of the state. Perhaps the people here could become more, uh, successful. My words evaporated as I spoke them, for I could not even entertain this as a possibility. Yeah, success? I've the only success around here. It's only because I sell beer cleaner than water. Oh, which you'd be wise to invest. The sick smell of cheap ale hit me again. I paused. You, uh, shit out a bit of blood? The sound of gargling. Uh, pardon? Water's dirty. Beer's clean. Simple's that. A mug was hastened to front the nearest stool, stealthily filled with a drink of a shade of yellow amber. Smelled tolerable. I sat. Outside a brew, the maid creaked. A hesitant sip drew a soft and stale taste, not wholly unpalatable, but strikingly unremarkable. <laughs> it keeps the worms out of you, that's all, she affirmed with an awkward, toothless grin. Uh, is there water? Only dirt water. Turn the clean stuff to ale. Only enough stills to make one or the other. The maid spoke slowly carrying an edge of genuine satisfaction on her voice. My face stiffened beyond my consent. You stay a while and you'll get it, lad. I felt her already muted concentration drift away from our dialogue and back to the rotting surfaces beneath her in practiced idleness. I knew, by some strange instinct, that I would get no more from the maid and turned my gaze to the pale bubbles of my drink. I instead shifted my ears to the idle chatter about me. Conversation was sparse, and I understood little through the thick garbling of the grey men's mouths. Though it seemed to me they only spoke of their fishing, digging and boozing, it was remarkable they could communicate to one another with such a dialect. Their vocabulary was vastly limited, and their few words were spoken as though their mouths were full of oil. I listened intently, yet I heard nothing of any real worth. As the afternoon progressed, a sense of exhaustion began to overtake me, and my ability to focus on my eavesdropping waned. The length of the journey and the subtle effects of the ale had finally begun to overtake my senses. I ordered no second mug, but held my seat for a short while before retiring to the single bedroom the inn possessed. 
a cramped, dingy closet at the back of the establishment, with an ancient, creaking bed with damp sheets only a few degrees of comfort greater than burlap. Sleep was uniquely difficult with damp covers, despite my acquaintance with poor lodgings. I settled into bed as best I could. I awoke slowly, first perturbed by the friction between the rough covers of the bed and the bare flesh of my forearms. I had left on most of my clothes from the days prior, desperate to avoid excess exposure to the poor excuse for bedding the room provided. Every article was damp to the touch and exceedingly uncomfortable to wear. I set about changing into a fresh pair of clothes. The floor creaked loudly in protest as I shift my weight onto a single foot, and the frail boards bent to a worrying degree, veritably threatening to give way to whatever lay beneath this filthy room. It was at this point that the scent of the place returned in force. That peculiar scent of fish, not unlike that of potted anchovies of the lowest quality, the type one might feed to an exotic bird rather than to themselves. I stomached as best I could, donning the fresh clothes from my pack. I hesitantly shoved the makeshift planks that constituted the door of my accommodations. The inn was sparsely lit in the early morning light, illuminated by only an infrequent scattering of awfully constructed lanterns. A strange, exhausted haze fell over me, which I attributed to mild dehydration. The barmaid eyed me hungrily, as though she was guided by some saleswoman instinct, alerting her to an imminent purchase. So, is there any water fit to drink here? I questioned as I approached. Come on to you as well, she chuckled dryly, her hideously cracked lips hardly parted as she spoke. I briefly pondered if she'd been in that spot all night. I sighed deeply, determined to keep my composure. Lighten up a bit. I've fair news for you and I both. News? I inquired, riddled with hesitance. Your tab has been paid. A calm, mechanical voice, vastly different from those of the parish men, came from my left flank. I turned my gaze over my left shoulder to observe a tall, slender, and uniquely upright man approach me. His skin was unhealthily pallid, contrasting the stark blackness of his peacoat. His calm eyes were encompassed in a veritable sea of wrinkles and age marks, obscured only by a sparse few locks of white hair. This old man slowly sauntered toward me with a confident smile that matched poorly with the general tone of the parish, just as his smooth locomotion matched poorly with his weathered appearance. His hand thrust forth to shake mine, without a moment's rest from the falsified warmness of his gaze. No, oh, so you're the outsider I've heard so much about. His toneless voice drew as he pretended to examine my appearance. Aye, I choked out. I suppose no one else here befits that description. I uttered, briefly taking his hand. An unusually firm grip and warm. <laughs> Just you and I, I forced a small laugh. Well, friend, I'll keep this offer succinct. He paused briefly. You'll work for me, and I'll pay. The benefactor's gaze remained unbroken. Oh, I appreciate the offer, sir, but... You're already employed by another party to investigate... I'm well aware of your type. Pardon me, but can I ask who you are, sir? Ah, the same entity that hired you. An anonymous benefactor. During the whole of our conversation, he never broke his false smile, nor did his dry tone waver in the least. His silent stare left me uncomfortable. I felt an odd compulsion to comply with his offer. It's simple. All you need to do is stay in my home for one week, 
and return to your other masters bearing the information that <laughs> I give you. You'll find the accommodations far more appealing than that woman's little room. He hushed his final few words. The cacophony of in noise. You will be paid and then sent home. Come, let us discuss your payment. The aged man performed a rapid about-face and began walking away slowly, liver-spotting crusted hands snapping loudly behind his back as he began walking. My eyes widened. The rapidity of his movement surprised me. For some unknown reason, I found myself looking to the barmaid for reassurance. She grinned madly and thrust a tankard in my direction. I took it. See you next time. Her wry grin expanded further. I hastened my way out of the door to meet this strange benefactor. I walked quickly into the dirt street to follow the man southwards, whose stark black form stood out in radical contrast to the swirling grey mix about him. Finally, I reached his side. Thirty thousand. The benefactor spoke as though he'd rehearsed this moment ad infinitum. That's quite an offer, sir, but it's the best you will get. Your intention is to profit, is it not? A moment's pause. Therefore, your best course of action is to choose the individual who will pay you best. His eyes gazed ahead towards some infinitely distant object. I chose not to speak, letting him continue walking as I followed at his side. His gaze remained steely as we jaunted down the grey street. I did my best to act undisturbed by the sloshing mess I was walking in. The parish men walked about us as we progressed. Often I found them glancing in my direction with disdain, but the sight of my companion seemed to ward off any extended glares. The men certainly were an unhealthy lot. I had oft subsided on less than wholesome feed. However, it appeared whatever these men ate was all but poisonous. Their skin, upon closer inspection, was horribly dotted with pores that were far too large. Their eyes bore evidence of what seemed to be cataracts, but their sight seemed to be unaffected, as their stares were precise and damning. It appeared we were approaching the northern edge of the parish, as the shacks that acted as residences for the parishioners became infrequent and eventually failed to appear in their entirety. The ground developed a slight bit more solidity, or perhaps my footing was slowly improving as I adjusted to my environments. It appeared the benefactor's home was a short distance up the road, a large window structure that was utterly distinct from the other buildings I'd seen up until this point in the quality of its structure. The manor even had a mailbox, though I doubted any courier would dare travel here. The wood that constructed the tall, thin manor was a light shade of brown, maintaining a state of decency mostly unseen in the old parish. The benefactor beckoned me up the stunted flight of steps to the manor onto the porch. The solid ground of the porch felt satisfying under my feet as I kicked off most of the mud. The aged man keyed the manor door open, and we entered into the main hall, an unusually small room with an ornate fireplace. The walls were made of painted wood, and I found the air was far less humid than outside, presumably due to the fireplace, which maintained a soothing orange smolder in the centre of the room. The old man moved a yellowed and dusty chair from one of the corners of the room, and gestured for me to sit in his twin. I accepted, and the seat was refreshingly comfortable. You'll have your choice of room. Food is provided. Little is required of you, no more than your word or perhaps a small parcel of favours, should the need arise, for which you will be, of course, compensated. Favours? Of what sort? The benefactor paused a brief moment, his gaze meandering to the floor. Oh, you must have noticed by now that men of a sound mind are rare here. Your relative stability is an exceptional asset to my employers and I. 
Imagine of those men attempting to analyze the progress of a dig site. You see, poor breeding runs abound here. Hence, their little uh, digging act. A soft, genuine chuckle. Mm, all right, then. If I may ask, what is it you hope to find? I've heard rumors of all manner of things. Archaeological digs, gold, oil, you name it. Oh, I could not tell you. Is all this anonymity and vagueness really necessary? Oh, you misunderstand. I mean to tell you, I do not know what the tunnels contain. Well, if anything. Pardon? Vague and intangible possibilities are what the parishioners really dig up from the earth. That, and in of itself, is of great value to um, certain parties. His voice briefly sounded organic. His words stuck with me a moment. Silence overtook us. The fireplace continued to crackle softly, its sight an uncommon comfort in the soaking abyss of the parish. You see, none of the men in these halls would stand to gain much from anything they might find. The rumors are the result of vast exaggeration and misinterpretation. There's likely nothing to be found, yet people such as you and I make quite the profit off their efforts. We are, as middlemen, selling the hope of endless wine and whores to our inferiors, and the possibility of a new venture to those we serve. I still did not speak. His blunt means of speech shocked me. I shifted uncomfortably as he gazed deeply into the fireplace. A slight of guilt pulled at the edge of his decrepit visage. Well, shall I show you to your quarters? Um, yeah, that'd be great, sir. I finished hesitantly. The benefactor slowly led me up a winding staircase in the grand hall, one room over. The wood of the staircase groaned softly with each step we took to the second floor. The benefactor took the first right down a thin hallway, which led to the spacious bedroom I was to be staying in for the next two weeks. It was large and warm, if a bit sparse, only containing a queen-size bed, nightstand and an anorexic fern-type plant in a pot far too large for the sad little thing. My benefactor cut my shoulder and gave me a friendly nod before leaving the room wordlessly. I looked at the bed blankly for a moment. I felt exhausted, despite having only been awake for a few hours. I stripped off the majority of my clothes, a frustrating affair considering the dampness that had crept its way into my garb during our walk to the manor. The dry air of the room was quite satisfying once my skin was bare to it. Certainly an improvement from the dank closet I had called home the evening prior. I lay down on the dull green bedding and pillows. I was, to this point, poorly acquainted with luxuries such as silk bedsheets and feather pillows. Six days of reading, uncharacteristic lethargy, and dining on crab and crusty bread passed before I awoke to the benefactor opening my chamber door after a mechanical series of rasps at the door. He stepped into the room, already bearing his typical smile and stiff suit. Oh, I must ask you for a favor, he began mechanically. You recall that I mentioned that such a thing may be necessary to fulfill your contract. I nodded. I would ask that you survey a tunnel for me. Would that, um, require me to enter the excavation? I uttered slowly. It would. I paused. I had no great desire to crawl around in some disgusting hole with those almost men. However, as I opened my mouth to utter my refusal, the scent of dusty gin and ancient straw bedding came to me from some dank recess of my mind, and I swiftly recalled my purpose. I could not recall from whence these thoughts arose in my mind. The details of my past had been thoroughly drowned in gin and repression. I recalled only a few hazy days in an asylum, and doctors who told me I had garnered some form of shell shock, similar to that of men who had survived the Great War. Opportunities such as this were rare in these times. Of course, sir. 
I owe you at least that much for the lovely conditions you've provided me. I spoke with as great an amount of counterfeit resolve as I could muster. His eyes drifted to the floor just a moment. His smile seemed to waver. Good, the benefactor mumbled, removing a dossier from his coat and handing it to me. A quick run-through of the file seemed to indicate that it contained the location of the tunnel in question, alongside various safety informations and listings of things I was to look for in the depths. The list was, to put it lightly, extensive and bizarre. Safety advice read similarly to a survival manual, more so than a mining safety guide. Further, my quarries in the tunnel not only included such obvious things as gold and jewels and ore, but also the likes of fetish objects, strange openings, or <clears throat> objects that would convey to the reasonable person a sense of sexual malaise. I spent the better part of the afternoon reading through the leaflets and notes, and the rest formulating a simple plot to infiltrate the tunnel. I resolved to avoid arousing the attention of the parish men, God willing. I feared, despite their frail nature, I could not overpower one of them in a melee. Several notes, often scribbled in the margins of more formal documents, warned me that the men were rather protective of their tunnels. Outsiders were hardly encouraged to intrude in any of their affairs, let alone their precious minds. I proceeded to spend the next few days observing the parish men about the town centre. I spent time in the inn, and following the men back and forth from the tunnelling areas to better understand their patterns and behaviours. The men were far too absorbed in their own thoughts and conversations to notice me often, let alone to fully acknowledge my presence. My observation of them, unfortunately, was largely fruitless. Their garbled and hardly intelligible speech only elaborated upon their three obsessions, digging, whoring, and drinking. Though, as my observation continued, I noticed a rather bizarre inconsistency. The men themselves hardly ever actually entered the chasms they so often spoke of. Rather, they stood or sat in crude wooden entry areas with simple chairs and lanterns, and simply writhed and fidgeted amongst themselves for hours in a bizarre manifestation of idle boredom. Occasionally, they would seem to receive some means of transport or shipment from within the mine. My position prone in the wood across the way from the tunnel afforded little insight to what lay within the tunnel. There appeared to be no light within. This sat poorly with me. It made little sense to me how the parish men could speak of digging and excavating constantly, yet never enter a tunnel. I inquired to the benefactor as to what he may know of this phenomenon, and was rewarded with not but roundabouts and non-answers. Following a careful week of surveillance and note-taking, I realized it had been a wasted effort. It seemed the only means by which to proceed would be to sneak my way into the tunnel. My plan was actually rather simple. I would bring two lanterns to the outside of the smallest tunnel entrance. I would light the first lantern and toss it a small ways off from the parish men in front of the tunnel entrance to lure them away. It all seemed quite simple then. Then again, do things not always seem so simple when one is seated upon the precipice of disaster? I awoke to my empty room, greeted only by my withered fern companion, a fellow silent observer in the parish who watched upon strange and incomprehensible folk by way of our ancient dusty window. My bedsheets were of a comforting dryness and coloration as they had been during the entirety of my stay. I glanced to the single, small window to my right, across the vast distance of the chamber. The streaks of dust, unusually bright for the parish, slipped past the turquoise blind and into the room. Darkness would fall soon enough, and I would begin my journey beneath the soaking earth of the parish. Those tunnels were no place for men of my ilk. The disease of my mind had stripped me of what I thought to be the entirety of my pride, 
Yet still, those wretched sores of the earth felt all too horrible for anything but parish men. Feeling well? Hmm. Cold. Rehearsed. Oh, morning, sir. Yeah, of course. Um, well, nervous is all. I stumbled with a desperate attempt to replicate a reassuring smile. Good. With a mindset such as that, you'll one day find yourself in shoes not so dissimilar to mine. The benefactor's face did not move above his nose, yet his smile widened slightly. The days of my youth are far gone, are they not? <laughs> Sly chuckling. I had no response and simply stared down to the bed before rising from it. Oh, listen to me, Rand. He approached, reaching into his pocket. Take this. You may require it. He extended his hand, which grasped a palm-sized vial of terribly dark and viscous green liquid, speckled with black. I eyed it cautiously, and recalled the unique hue of absinthe. It's a simple anti-anxiety tonic. A mild opiate substance in pleasant-tasting solvent. He spoke quickly, breaking eye contact for the shortest of moments. I was hesitant to take it. I was rather opposed to the use of intoxicants following my previous ales, opiates especially. I stared into the file, watching the specks dance about in a mesmerizing waltz. I reached out and took it, acting out in routine, and placed it in my pocket slowly, as to savor the cool feeling of the glass. My gaze remained on the bed, transfixed strangely by the patterns of the sheets as my thoughts drifted aimlessly about some past I struggled to recall through the haze of drink. The benefactor left the room silently, with a paternal tap on my shoulder. Everything felt quite off, though I attributed such feelings to my fear of the tunnel depths. I attempted to rationalize the situation with the thought that Nothing could be in the tunnels worse than parish men. Logic failed to calm me, though. The conscious mind always flails helplessly in the grasp of the baser instinct, does it not? I set about my journey just as the refractions of the sun's light began to disappear from the ever-present fog that surrounded the parish, and as the area was subsequently drained of light, my entrance onto the main street of the road signaled the last light of day. The muddy street fell to an oppressive and murky darkness, broken only by the weak lamplight and the building fronts, which formed blurry orbs of radiance a few feet about themselves. I trudged slowly along, both comforted by the anonymity of the dark and painfully aware of my own lack of sight. The mud sloshed about my boots loudly, despite the gentle nature of my footfalls, which only added to those of the parish men trodding the same path to the chasms. In my practical invisibility amongst the commoners, I felt an odd and impossible kinship with them, such that one would feel in a funeral procession alongside distant and unknown relatives, strangers bearing an ominous common cause. I drew near to the holes after an hour's hike, and again hid amongst the woods across the scattered ramshacks of entrances. I stood only about ten yards away from the sturdiest looking of the entrances, guarded by two scrawny parishmen, who appeared even more decrepit than the most of their peers. I drew a long and shaky breath of moist air, before drawing my first lantern from a string on my belt, and spindly match from my pocket. I lit the overall lantern and tampered the fire to a slow burn. I closed my eyes tightly for only a moment to summon my resolve before throwing the lantern a short ways past my marked entry. The glass of the lantern shattered into dust, and the lantern's oil quickly spouted into a small area of bluish conflagration. The townsmen jumped and swore unintelligibly at the sound. Their panic only escalated when they noticed the flames. The pair ran over and 
set about a desperate and clumsy attempt at fighting the fire using what appeared to be thin sheets of burlap. I wasted no time with watching, and as quickly and subtly as I could, I burst into the shoddy tunnel entrance. I grasped the final wooden support before the hole went below ground and froze stiff. Before me was a veritable abyss. I had yet to light the lantern I intended to actually use in the tunnel. I heard the men begin cackling and realized they must have extinguished the flames from the first lantern. I panicked and threw myself barreling into the dark. I groped at the soaking earthen walls as I descended the steep incline into the earth in a desperate attempt to make up for my lack of sight. I descended only until I could no longer see the dim light of the surface at my back. I grasped desperately at my belt to locate the second lantern. I then grasped its small base and desperately lit it with another match from my pocket. The dim blaze illuminated the hall I was in for only a few feet in both directions with a pale orange haze. Despite regaining my ability to see, I was left relatively uninformed as to the nature of my surroundings. The tunnel ahead stretched on farther than the light of the lamp could hope to carry. The straightness of the tunnel betrayed the shoddy construction of the thing. I began my hesitant descent further into the hole. As I descended the tunnel, it became increasingly haphazard segmented off into smaller branches that spiraled off of their own accord. I stayed along the singular straight path as much as possible during my descent. Slowly, however, the chasm became stranger. The path split and forked frequently into smaller pathways, and even tiny earthen rooms that smelled revolting and appeared to contain some odd type of animal dung or remarkably crude furniture that mimicked tables and chairs and cots made of either clay or splintered wooden pillars. One even contained a knife that appeared to be used to gut fish or game, which I pocketed to return to the benefactor. After what felt like an hour of arduous exploration, the main thoroughfare ended in a wooden floor and wall that formed a sort of porch that acted as a large support for the perpendicular paths that split away from the first tunnel, occupied by a nearly presentable set of chairs and a crate acting as a table. My legs were tired from the walking, exacerbated by my poor fitness, so I decided to sit a moment. I took the chair facing left and groaned as I took the weight off my aching legs. I felt ashamed of how I'd let myself become so frail at so young an age. I had yet to see thirty years, yet I must look and feel as a man in his forties. I dreaded to look in a mirror, and seeing the wrinkles and spots of a man many years my senior, and thus had avoided them habitually these past few years. I stared at the floor bleakly. Why was I here? scampering in a dingy pit in the middle of nowhere for a paycheck. There was some hazy memory beyond the drunken stupor of the past years that I could recall clearly, when I had some hope of being something more than an urchin in an alley. Well, I felt my face grow hot with shame or disgust or some other convoluted form of emotion. My reverie was cut short. I heard some far-off sound to the left only barely crossing the audible threshold. Perhaps it was someone scratching, or breathing. I froze and listened. The sound slowly approached with a procession of dull padding. I quickly snuffed out my light, and obscured myself partially behind the crate. The padding sound grew both louder and nearer. Despite the softness of the footfalls due to the watery earth beneath, I could tell that the thing approaching me was loud and heavy. I waited several breaths for it to stop, yet the sound only grew louder. I ceased breathing and clamped shut my stinging eyes. 
I clenched my fist and dashed back upwards, the direction I'd come, and into a side tunnel in a desperate attempt to hide. I moved as quickly as the cramped space would allow, dragging my body against the dirt walls of a crevice until I emerged into one of the odd rooms. I bumped painfully into the walls and wooden furniture, still without the aid of sight. I stopped and crouched down to the earth and stared blindly into the dark. I paused, my own breathing, and waited. Silence. Stillness. I exhaled deeply and lit my lantern. Relief filled me as the burning carbon left my lungs. The room was sufficiently illuminated, yet exhaustion led me to continue gazing back the direction I had come, trembling. Though my ears perked as I heard the padding begin again, impossibly close. I set down the lantern and stood at full posture, pausing to listen a moment. My back slammed against the wall in a sudden flurry of movement, forcing the air from my lungs as my back collided with the wall, my vision distorted as the back of my head slammed against the earthen wall behind me. My sight began to return to me as I felt my neck grabbed by some soft yet forceful appendage. In my days, I slowly began to recognize the form of my assailant. Bright, gray, pupilless eyes gazed at me, utterly devoid of expression or understanding, surrounded by bulbous and fleshy skin of an odd brown-orange hue that bulged into irregular and massive boils across the entirety of its huge, disgusting head. Its nose, or what remained of it, was tiny and upturned, and leaked mucus and foul air in gross quantities. Its fat, naked body pressed firmly into mine, drenching me instantly with a vast amount of second-hand sweat or bile, similar to that on its hand. Its hand was, fortunately, too large and malformed, it seemed, to be able to fully constrict my airways. I swung desperately at its face, succeeding only in exhausting my oxygen in one of its massive bile pockets, coating my hand in a sickening deluge of grey, stringy ooze. I screamed and sobbed as it held me for what felt like minutes. My scratching, wailing and kicks were futile and served only to anger it further, and it moved its second hand to assist the first in strangling me. Its second, more hideous limb exploded with bile as it struggled to bend in such a way that it would allow it to grip my throat. Suddenly, I recalled the gutting knife. I groped desperately amongst my pockets for the thing. Its force came in my back trouser pocket as I began to struggle for air. I gripped the knife just as my vision began to grey in my periphery, and I desperately plunged it forward above the thing's sternum. It recoiled in pain with a gasp. I coughed and stumbled a few steps away as I regained my ability to breathe. I glanced back at my attacker, which had already begun approaching me yet again, clearly enraged as it stomped in my direction through the soaking earth. In a bout of unknown rage, I charged forward and grabbed the knife, stuck my bladed hook on the spine and dropped my knees, opening the beast's stomach with a sickening scratching sound. My hair and torso were showered in blood, and the stringy grey pulp that made home in the boils of its flesh. The thing let forth a gargling wail as I collapsed to the ground, and it stumbled back toward the opposite wall. I fought the urge to vomit and looked to the beast, which was rapidly becoming soaked in its own horrible fluids as it tried to hold its bisected abdomen together with one hand and reached spitefully in my direction with the other. I stood and watched in horror as the beast glared at me with its sightless eyes. It held an impossibly human expression for such an abomination. Its hateful glare only managed to barely conceal its nigh-palpable agony. The thing 
took a single, feeble step forward, causing yet another surge of adrenaline to force its way into my mind. In a moment of terrified instinct, I gripped the lantern from the ground and hurled it at the beast. Broken glass showered the floor in a moment of terrifying darkness before the thing erupted in horrible blue flames. It screamed and thrashed wildly as the taut bubbles of pus on the thing's body burst as they were set alight. The thing, no longer inflated by the constricting pockets on its body, adopted far more human mannerisms as it flailed helplessly about. Its wailing was not unlike my own. I could take no more of such, and fled back into the darkness of the tunnel I'd come from. The thing's screams echoed forever into the hallways and crevices of the tunnels. I searched desperately for the route upwards, and simply clambered at any path that seemed to lead to a large tunnel or towards the surface. I recall little of this experience, as I had no means of distinguishing neither time nor space. I writhed in that earthly abyss for what felt like days, pausing only to wipe the horrible viscera from my body in sporadic bursts of disgust. After some time, I found the main tunnel, which I must have crossed dozens of times in my feral scrambling. I bolted upwards until I saw light at the surface and sprinted towards it. I crossed the threshold of an unfamiliar wooden archway back into the grey of the parish. I rushed past the men at the gate and ignored their empty gazes and garbled yelling as I passed, and my burning legs dragged me far into the swampy wood, where I collapsed to my knees. Even my knees failed to hold me, and I fell to the muddy floor into a fetal position and sobbed. I could feel my heart palpitating in my chest, and my lungs ached as though plagued by asthma. I shook uncontrollably, and felt as though some form of seizure would overtake me. My mind returned to my forgotten habits, and my arm, as if of its own accord, dug in my breast pocket for the vial the benefactor had given me. I struggled for a moment with the cork, and my bestial impatience took over, and drove me to snap the glass neck of the bottle in twain, before chugging the liquid quickly enough to bypass the entirety of my tongue. It collapsed further somehow, as the chemicals took their effect on my body. My heart slowed, and my breathing calmed, as my mind slowly drifted away. I felt free. The next few days are well beyond my recollection. All I was aware of was awakening in the benefactor's manner in a daze. I recall being fed more crab and bread and rice, blankly. I think he read to me at some point, but it is my belief that my mind was too damaged to truly understand words in their literal sense. The old man administered more doses of the strange liquid. These far smaller than the last I'd taken. As the unknown days went on in a blur, not unlike a fever dream, I slowly regained my awareness and speech. I began walking and reading and eating on my own again. I'm unsure of whether my brain ever fully recovered from the shock and chemical abuse, but I did regain my senses well enough to care for myself after a few days. During this time, I ate and spoke little, simply choosing to sleep away most of my time left in the manor in the haze of ether. The benefactor did not ask anything more of me than to describe my experience in the tunnels. He, surprisingly, seemed unfazed about my lack of findings, as I had expected him to express at least some mild disappointment towards the barrenness of the excavation. He reassured me that the truth was all I could give him, and that I had done well. I found his approval oddly comforting. A few days into my recovery, I thought to ask the benefactor to explain what such a monstrosity was doing in the tunnels. He was, expectedly, very cautious to explain to me what the thing was. He eventually relented, in his typical mechanical tone, 
that it was merely the product of untold generations of incest and alcoholism that caused gross deformities amongst the townsfolk, a reality they took advantage of by putting the most hardy of the deformed into the depths. I found this explanation unsatisfactory, but chose to hold my tongue, fearing the sanctity of my pay. After a few weeks in his home, he sent me back to Baton Rouge, from whence I had come, with my check and a bottle of primo scotch with a neat red ribbon tied around its neck, which signalled a welcome reintroduction of liquor into my life. My other sponsors also paid me, and selling my story to some pulp fiction authors left me wild amounts of profits and notoriety. To some extent, this aided my recovery. Drink, opiates, women, and gorgeous accommodations were just enough to keep the thoughts of the backwards parish in the back of my adult mind. Over the years, in fact, the names of the places and people slowly faded. The minutiae of their faces, voices, and lives sunk beneath my desperate quest of opulence. This would not last, however as my old vices returned to me in full effect, and over time primo scotch became bargain bin liquor, and fine women became petty whores yet again. My constant craving for indulgence left me expending my earnings at incredible rates, as the thoughts of the past slowly gained traction in my mind. This unsustainable cycle of drinking and whoring left me all but penniless in the matter of a couple of years, despite my vast newfound wealth. With what little I had left in my estate, after liquidating the vast majority of my assets, I set about finding an even greater fortune. As I weaned off the liquor, I began to dream again of a proper home and life, and once again felt shame looking at my withering visage. I searched frantically for work, for anything that will pay in gross sums quickly, no matter the cost. Soon enough, utilizing what sparse few connections I had left, I got a contract. After preparing a small pack of clothes and necessities, I journeyed to where I would meet the stagecoach headed to my destination. And there, this lovely carriage awaited, to carry to some fresh opportunity, did it not? The passenger chuckles as he finishes his tale. The aged drivers give the horses the signal to slow down as they approach the town. The dusty old wagon creaked and moaned as we shuddered to a halt. <laughs> Here, yeah, interesting story, sir. Best of luck to you. Well, quite a slow burner, that one, and absolutely drenched with atmosphere. Hope you enjoyed that. Quite a Lovecraftian feel to it, that one. I really enjoyed it, and apologies to the author. It's taken me probably more than a year to get around to reading it, but when the stories are an hour long or longer than that... It does take a bit of a while, trying to keep the channel ticking over week by week, day by day. So the longer ones, I need a lot of time to devote to them to get them done. Well, hope you thought it was worth it. Comments in the comment section below the vid, please. I'll do my best as ever to reply to as many as I can. Well, enough from me for one evening. I, of course, will be back again very, very soon with another story for you. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?